Uh, time for the first presentation. Um, hello everyone, uh, I'm Jahan, I'm CEO of Althea. Um, and uh, I started working on this project probably in 2015, um, but uh, Justin actually had been working on it in like 2013, um, but, but it took a pause for a while, so. Um, anyway, we're, we're trying to create faster, cheaper, decentralized internet. Um, and this presentation I'm gonna go over basically the 101 of what that means. Um, in the later presentations in the day, um, Graham's gonna be going over how to actually set up networks. Um, and Graham comes from the WISP world, the wireless ISPs. Um, these are traditional ISPs that use wireless hardware. And um, an Althea network will use all the same hardware, so his knowledge is basically you know, very applicable to Althea. But I'm gonna explain a little bit about what makes Althea different from a traditional wireless ISP. So, uh, next slide. So, um, what we're trying to do is allow communities to build and maintain their own profitable, decentralized uh, internet infrastructure. And so, um, the reason for that is like, in a lot of places, the internet's provided by a really big company um, that's from a different, uh, that has, uh, is from a different state or even a different country. Um, and they don't really, um, they're not very motivated to, to improve service a lot. I mean, sometimes the service is really good. Some places have fiber, um, but some places the service is really bad and they don't really care too much to improve it. Um, and so with Althea, we're trying to give people the tools um, to set up networks uh, where it's, the whole network is not owned by one company. Um, and we think that's good ideologically because we believe in decentralization. We believe in people owning their own uh, infrastructure and stuff, but we also think that it will make it easier for communities to set up better internet for themselves because you eliminate the whole thing of one person needing to be the business owner who gets the loan, who sets up the network and stuff, because our software makes it so that um, different participants in the network can all work together uh, and all the, all the payments and the coordination of, of the participants is handled um, is handled automatically by our software, basically. So, next slide. Basic system um, is, uh, so you gotta pay for the internet. It's not like, uh, there are more nonprofit mesh networks, and I, I volunteer with one in Oakland. Um, and uh, Althea is not necessarily free internet. Um, it is, it's decentralized, but basically what you do to, to pay for the internet, instead of sending a check to uh, Comcast or whatever every month, um, you load some tokens into your router. Uh, so these are, um, at the moment, Ethereum-based tokens. Um, and we are also, right now we're prototyping with Ether itself, but it's a volatile cryptocurrency that's not really ideal for the users. So we're um, right now trying to get it to work with, uh, with the stable coin, um, which, which people don't have to worry about loading up their router and then having the value crash and then you know having their month's internet be like cut short because the cryptocurrency markets. So that's basically what you do. You load up dollars basically into your router um, at home. And that router is then hooked up usually to an antenna that's on your roof. Uh, it, it depends, maybe if you're in an apartment building, you just plug it into the wall. Uh, it really, the physical scenario is different in every, you know, at, everywhere. Uh, it really depends on what the line of sight is and how the internet's getting to you. Um, Graham is gonna tell us a lot more about that too. Uh, so then basically, um, you got this antenna on your house and it's connecting to other houses and um, they are, some of them are closer to a source of the internet, it's called a gateway, um, and some of them are further away and they pass the signal um, among this network of, of, of nodes and then um, each, each node along the path gets a little bit of what the end user is paying for the internet. So, next slide. And so the big, the big thing we're trying to accomplish here is instead of Everybody paying the ISP, uh, who's depicted up here, that's what they look like usually, um, <laughs> and uh, everyone paying Comcast or whatever um, for, uh, to, to sort of provide this network for them. It's more that people are paying each other. Um, and if somebody wants to upgrade their equipment on their house, upgrade their hardware, uh, create a better route or whatever, uh, they'll, they'll get more of the traffic. Um, that they'll, they'll, they'll essentially be supplying more of the traffic to their neighborhood and, and make more money. So it's like this form of uh, almost like a bandwidth uh, market in, in a way locally. Um, so next slide. So uh, I'm gonna go through the sequence of images here. Um, this kind of illustrates uh, what we're 
what we're doing. So this is a depiction of our firmware. That's what it looks like um, <laughs> inside the router. But, but what this is meant to communicate here is that um, our software essentially puts an ISP in every router. And what I mean by that is, is that you might not be familiar with, with how ISPs work, but they'll, they'll make deals for among each other, for peering, uh, to connect to each other. Um, and so we put that into the router. So the router connects to other routers and it peers with them. Um, and the router also, the firmware here, um, figures out you know, what's, the, what's the cheapest available internet at the time, uh, what's the best quality, and it balances these factors and, and handles a lot of other things, handles the payments, uh, pays second by second. Um, to, to the neighbors, so that's, uh, that's how that works in the slide. So these routers all uh, link together, and this is more abstract here, obviously. Um, and they, they, this is like the peering I was just talking about. And uh, they use something called a routing protocol to find out what the path to the internet is, and not only what, what the path is, but what's the, what's the fastest path and the cheapest path. And uh, for more of a T technical, technically, we, we use uh, the Babel routing protocol, and we have some patches for that, which, um, which help it uh, route based on price as well as quality. Next slide. So um, bringing it into the real world, uh, each of those routers in the previous picture is inside someone's house. And uh, you can see here on the left, uh, we've got this would, be, this would be the gateway, and it's connected to uh, some other houses. And then on the top here, this house is is supplying their neighbor with internet. And you can see here the, um, the internet connection here represented by uh, zeros and ones is going in one direction and the money's going the other direction. And so uh, that's, that's how the, uh, it's sort of like if you buy a, a candy bar from the store, um, the, the store bought that candy bar from a distributor and the distributor bought that candy bar from a factory and we're sort of bringing that to internet access on, on a very granular local level. Next slide. Oh, I should have gone on the slide before. This is a depiction of the internet here, and um, so that's plugged in with a big plug. And uh, yeah, so this is the gateway, like I was just saying. Uh, and generally, so with Althea's software, a network can have many gateways. It can, um, you, you, can have, you can have a lot of different places in the network where it's connected to the internet and they're all competing. But in general, when you get to the practical realities of it, most networks are going to have, um, at first at least, they're going to have one gateway. Um, and that's had, due to a lot of factors that Graham will get into, but um, a lot of it is you, you really want a very reliable um, commercial grade connection to supply, uh, you know, to supply your town with internet. You don't necessarily want to be piggybacking off of another retail uh, ISP. Um, so that's, that's the, uh, the gateway is attached to, uh, that's called backhaul usually, like a commercial grade connection to the internet is backhaul. Uh, and that's how the internet access is getting into this network here. And if you can see here, so, so this, the gateway is making a good amount of money, and they have, that's good because they actually have to uh, pay a lot of money for a backhaul connection. But then also, this guy at the top here, intermediary node, uh, it is making money by, um, by carrying the traffic from this node on the far right. Uh, and so that's this built-in incentive for expansion as well. So next slide. There's another factor as well, the uh, subnet DAO. Um, DAO means Decentralized Autonomous Organization. It's kind of a mouthful, um, and uh, we, we might, I don't know, we might change the name of that, but basically the idea is that, that that's an organization of people on the local level who are maintaining a network. And the reason the DAO comes in there is that they're using a, um, a blockchain-based uh, organizational system. So the payments that I talked about, the direct payments between the routers, those are based on blockchain, and also the subnet DAO is too. And uh, so each node of the network as well as paying its neighbors for uh, the bandwidth that it's using, also pays a fixed uh, monthly fee to the subnet DAO that it's connected to. And um, that, that, that organization, I'll show some screenshots of the, uh, of the software a little bit later in the slideshow, and also Justin, I think, is going to do a more in-depth tour of it later as well. Um, but uh, that software lets that organization both uh, hold the fees from all the routers and uh, spend those maybe on promoting the network or uh, providing tech support to people. Um, those are both important things that ISPs do uh, that you wouldn't necessarily get in a decentralized network otherwise. And it also, the DAO also lets them add and remove routers from the network. And that's important if uh, there is, you know, somebody who's, who's trying to jam the network or, or mess it up or something, they can just remove them. That's usually not going to happen, but um, 
it, it gives it uh, a point of sort of administrative control of the network. Um, and I also want to point out with the subnet DAO that so this, this intermediary node on the top here, it could actually be part of two different subnet DAOs at once. And that's kind of a key difference from how ISPs work today because today the way ISPs work is that, that they'll, usually, uh, they'll usually own their own, um, their own equipment, their own radio equipment. Um, and they'll, uh, they'll oftentimes rent towers that are also rented by their ISPs and stuff. Uh, but with this system, you can actually have parts of the, the infrastructure, the whole node that's being used by these different subnet DAOs. So you might have one subnet DAO that provides, um, oh. so you, you might have one subnet DAO that provides um, a, very, uh, a, a very full service kind of uh, experience. You call them up and they come to your house. They screw the thing to your, uh, to your, to your roof and they, they, they show you how to plug the router in and you call them up and, and they might have a higher subnet DAO fee. And uh, you, you could have a node that's on the same network connected to the same intermediary nodes uh, that's on a subnet DAO that's like a more bare bones. So it's like really for, you know, for the techies, like if you really want to set up your own thing, you really want to do it yourself, then you can, save, um, you can save on these subnet DAO fees in that case. And so we're... Subnet DAO fees could really be as low as, um, as low as you want, but we are thinking typically the way it would work probably well in a lot of networks is to have those be uh, half or maybe a little bit more for like the high service kind of subnet DAOs of the, of the total payments people are making with the rest of it being made up by uh, bandwidth payments that fluctuate as using bandwidth. So um, yeah, I guess that's subnet DAOs. Next, uh, next slide. And then it's just showing the expansion. So as you can see, um, this node on the top used to be the only intermediary node in the picture. And just uh, terminology, when I say intermediary node, I mean a node that is serving, uh, serving other nodes in the network. And um, the software will let any node be an intermediary node. However, uh, practically in the real world, uh, to provide good service, intermediary nodes are probably going to be using different, um, different radio hardware. They'll want to make sure that they uh, their router is, 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 is plugged into a good source of power and stuff like that. And so intermediary nodes, a lot of the time, uh, there's kind of a, a dichotomy between client nodes, which are very small, and then intermediary nodes. You might jump up not just to serving one other node, but um, like 50 with a tower or something. So, um, but in this picture, um, obviously this, this node here just started out um, as the one on the far right started out as just a client node and they upgraded their hardware a little bit. They had some neighbors down over further right uh, who also wanted to get access to this. And um, they uh, you know, installed another radio thing. You can see this bar shape that's supposed to represent a sector antenna, which is a more powerful radio thing that can uh, do like a wider field of projection of the signal. And these two houses got added uh, as well. So uh, that's what this is depicting here. And then the subnet DAO is, is helping them with that, that too. So we anticipate that being a function of, of subnet DAO organizations as well. Um, so uh, next slide. This is a little bit about the software. Um, I want to also, the, uh, there, there's a thing called the exit node. And the exit node is, this is just showing the screen on, on, the, on the dashboard where you select it. Uh, the exit node is like a VPN server out on the internet. And, um, the exit node actually does speed tests to make sure that the nodes in the network are providing good service. And it also functions as a VPN so that your neighbor can't see your browsing, for instance. Um, and then also another, another important role is, is that a lot of the time um, people are worried about being responsible for the, if, if you are using, if you're selling your internet connection into one of these networks, uh, you know, sometimes you're worried about um, you know, what people are doing on the internet, whether that's going to come back to you. With the exit node, it doesn't because uh, for, for anyone monitoring the traffic on the internet, it appears to come from the exit node. So it removes any liability from people who are selling their connections into the network. So that's an important role. Uh, next slide. And this is the interface of subnet DAO. So um, it doesn't quite look like this anymore, but um, we're building on a platform called Aragon. Um, some of you may be familiar with. It's an Ethereum um, kind of organization platform where you can design uh, organizational rules. And, and these are a lot like uh, the rules that govern um, corporations and, and nonprofits, except this is all done on the blockchain. And so you can have votes uh, instead of, you know, instead of using 
uh, you know, like board meetings and having a binder with meeting minutes and stuff. It's, it's on the blockchain. And um, instead of a bank account, uh, it just holds it in, uh, in like a multi-sig wallet, basically. And here it's showing the, the node lists. So um, you can add them, remove them. That's kind of the network administration function of it. Um, I'm also going to add with the subnet DAOs, um, the blockchain does give us all the tools to allow them to perform their basic business functions without any legal registration. Uh, but in a lot of cases, there are benefits to legal registration with the government um, as a nonprofit uh, or, or as a for-profit because there's liability protection. Um, there's also uh, nonprofits, there's tax benefits, so you have to jump through some hoops to get that. So uh, we expect that probably a lot of subnet DAOs will um, elect to do this, but it's also nice in, in areas where um, you know, it might be a lot of, it might be difficult to get registered with the government or, or that kind of infrastructure might not exist. Um, this allows people there to set up organizations that have the same capabilities as, as a corporation would in, in, in a first world country. So that's cool. Uh, next slide. So I just want to show you some pictures from um, a couple of our, we, we right now have two deployments underway. One of them is in Medellin in Colombia and one of them is in Klatskanai, which is like an hour from here. Um, and this is Medellin. And so this place, uh, very, very steep, very steep hillside. Um, beautiful view. I, I think I might have a few of the view in here, but um, it's basically, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of a low income community um, and they don't have a lot of very good, they do have power um, and they have uh, sewers and stuff and they have some infrastructure, but these areas were historically um, not really even part of the municipal city um, and they've been they've been getting them more connected and stuff but the internet access is still um, is, is still pretty spotty and pretty slow up there and uh, so and also it's it's uh, it's I think it's about forty dollars a month but that's uh, very expensive for most people in that area so um, with Althea we've set up um, these little uh, we came and did a, did a net worth of about 40 nodes and this uh, this year is an inter on the on the right here is an intermediary node, and uh, so he's got the dish which is pointing up at um, uh, a school that's on top of the hill in the area, which kind of functions as the gateway node, and then he's also connected to his neighbors uh, with outdoor Ethernet cables, and they just they just ran those kind of across you know just kind of across the the streets and over the roofs and stuff like that, and uh, that's. Uh, you know, a, a lot of times radio hardware is is really practical, but you can also use Ethernet, and that was a really good fit for this this location. Next slide. Um, and here's a view from um, this is not a view from the gateway, but it's kind of a little bit below the gateway, and you can see um, these are all the houses. And I don't know if this was from before or after we installed this stuff, but also it's a little hard to see the dishes um, in this scale of of shot because it's just uh, it's, it's it's too small, but um, as you can see, this, this area was very kind of ideal for setting up a line of sight um, Wi-Fi network because, uh, and that's another thing Graham will touch on, line of sight is really important with a lot of this directional radio equipment because, um, because that's, that's how it works. Um, some, some frequencies, like the frequencies used by cell phones, can go through walls and stuff like that, but um, most unlicensed frequencies that, that are easy to set up and stuff, they do need, you need to be able to see the other transmitter on the other end. So this was like great because all these houses are all within Sight of, of the gateway. Uh, next, uh, next slide. Uh, this is from Klatskanai. Um, so this is a uh, this is a tower that was built by the uh, the residents there by Sean. Um, this is where they were loading it up. Um, that tower is on the top of a hill. Um, and so again, that's the line of sight thing. It's um, useful. Obviously, hills and towers and stuff um, are all very good for um, <laughs> getting up high and being able to see a lot of different places from them. Um, just logically a high place. It's going to have more line of sight to different places. Uh, and then here's one of the, um, one of the client nodes. Uh, and they've, uh, they've attached it to the side of the house. And um, that's actually, I don't believe that one's pointing at this tower. It's actually pointing at Deborah's computer repair shop. But uh, unfortunately, uh, the tree has, <laughs> has grown a little bit now. <laughs> so they're going to have to, <laughs> they're going to have to trim it a little bit. Um, so yeah, one of the things that like really blocks line of sight is wet foliage. Um, and Oregon has a lot of wet foliage. So, <laughs> um, next slide. Oh, that's it. I think that's the last. That's the last slide. Um, so uh, yeah, how am I on time actually right now? You're good. We have some time for questions. 
OK, cool. Yeah, are there any questions? Uh, yes, Clark. Mm. Just out of curiosity. So the, he was asking, what was the price per user in Columbia? So we, the one in Columbia is still in progress. We're still, um, we're still like uh, trying to get the backhaul hooked up, which often is is pretty challenging. Um, and I actually I should have put a picture in the slide deck of that, but uh, there, there's a place that's more in the city proper that has the fiber connection coming in, and it beams it up to that hillside. Um, so that that's not live yet. What we want to target though is. Um, the the way we sort of the, the way we uh, oh hey Sean just Sean just walked in oh, look. <laughs> <laughs> the the way the way we um, anyway back to the subject the, the the way we target is is if you look at the median use in the U S people use about two hundred gigabytes a month um, that can vary a lot of course um, but uh, so so we try to target uh, we try to we try to target that so people are going to be paying in the U S something comparable to uh, what they would be paying at that level of usage. In Colombia, um, the uh, in Colombia the uh, people probably people don't have as much money, and they're they I'm sure you know they, they might use less because of that. So uh, what we do have to think about is that the backhaul is costing um, is when, once it's on it's going to cost I think about uh, three hundred dollars a month, um, and that's a hundred megabit backhaul. Um, so that can comfortably serve the number of of homes we have connected. Um, but basically, what we'll probably be charging, I think, is like around maybe like five cents per gigabyte. I think and basically, figure it around a twenty dollar a month. Yeah. Fee, fee for folks. So it's it's always it's very it's very variable, and it really and the other thing is that we obviously we're we have a heavy hand in this whole thing because we're showing them how to set it up, and the software is still early. It's not intuitive and stuff. Um, but ultimately, it is up to the uh, gateway and intermediary nodes to decide how much they want to charge. And if you charge more, you might make more money, but people also might use less. People might, when there are more routes in the network, with more nodes set up, they might even just, their, their routers might just switch over to a cheaper route, if that exists. Um, so yeah, that, that's what we're trying to target. Um, but it should be, with a, if, if everyone who's using it is paying about $20 in per month, um, that should give them a pretty good amount of data and also um, be able to uh, have, the, have the, the backhaul and the intermediary nodes break even. Um, so that's what we're thinking. Oh uh, yes. Could it be set up to be more of a like a premium kind of thing where it's like a lower speed for free, but then you can like upgrade your connection by? Yeah. Uh, so you're asking, can it be set up to be a freemium model so you can have a lower speed for free and then upgrade your connection? Um, that would be that that that. So we already have something that's a little bit like that. So basically, you can. Um, it's a setting on the routers. You can you can um, change how much the routing protocol is going to prefer. Uh, a, a, a low price or a high quality. So um, if you wanted to have it set up in a freemium model, people who don't want to pay as much can just set their, um, can set their balance down to, uh, to, to a lower price and a lower speed. So right now, the state of the software, that's, that's not going to do much unless there are two other nodes, one that's cheap and one that's expensive. But um, we we do have some stuff in the works where um, one node could essentially offer both of those rates. Um, and then also right now there is like a, well, I guess that's fine. Uh, there, there is a, uh, a free tier, so, which is used just for, that's actually in there just for bootstrapping like payments and stuff like that, but that uh, would be usable at a very slow speed. Uh, yes? Oh, for the hardware. He was asking what the upfront cost was for the hardware in the communities. Um, in uh, Klatsk and I, the in initial cost, I think, totaled out to like maybe $1,200. Um, and that was, how much was, that was, uh, that was the gateway, and then it was like maybe eight nodes? Yeah. Eight. yeah. So it's pretty, it's pretty affordable stuff. Um, in Colombia, it, it ended up being more, um, I think more like $6,000 with all the equipment because... Uh, that involved, um, 40 nodes that could be served with that, right? yeah, it's like 40, 40 nodes because that, that involved. So, so if you break it down, like uh, the rate, there was a the radio equipment. There was these, these big dishes that were uh, getting the signal from um, inside the city up to the hill. And there was uh, 
These sector antennas, which are uh, the ones that do the wide beam, um, those are also a little bit priced. Those are around $200 a piece. Um, and then we had, I believe, seven of those dishes like you saw mounted on the window um, for the intermediary nodes. And then we had a bunch of switches. Each intermediary node would get a switch with uh, eight ports. Um, and then, of course, the routers for everyone. So we used, um, we used these. Oh, well, it's kind of a short cable. Uh, I was going to show you the router. We use this, this type of router here is $90 for the intermediary nodes that can do um, 100 megabits. And uh, then we use this other type of router that's a little bit slower uh, for the client nodes that are be, uh, to be connected over the Ethernet. Um, so, yeah, all told, it was about $6,000 for 40, um, 40, 40 households. And did, were you able to, were you, people in the community, were they able to set it up on their own, or did you need to bring specialists or training them? Uh, well, me, me and Deborah went down there, and uh, so we showed people how to do stuff. Uh, generally, I mean, as, as it usually is, you, you have like, you know, you have that one guy who's like more techie. And so there was this kid called Tamario, and that was actually his house we were showing there. Uh, and he basically learned very quickly how to crimp uh, Ethernet cables. Um, and um, he, he basically was running around the whole time we were there. He was running around getting, uh, getting everyone hooked up. Um, and uh, yeah, we, we brought down a, a, a big roll of Ethernet. Um, and so crimping is when you put the ends on it, and we'll have a thing about that here too, I think. But uh, yeah, he went around, hooked it all up, and um, the uh, yeah the people in the community they 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 had a really easy time grasping the concept. I feel like almost easier to explain than it is you know in the U.S. maybe because they were like, oh yeah, I can pay for as much as I use, and I can sell it to my neighbor too. They 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 got that pretty quickly, so they were they were excited to get hooked up. Um, but Pascal. Tristan, what type of agreement was done with uh, wherever you install hardware, um, being that you know um, it's some form of responsibility for whosoever has equipment in their vicinity. So, did, was there any challenge uh, as far as you know, um, maybe telling someone, hey, I want to hook up an antenna here to serve um, the community and and so. On? Uh, yeah, he was asking what kind of agreements we were doing with people who were hosting equipment, and um, the answer is we didn't do any kind of agreements. So uh, we, as as a company, we 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 did pay for the equipment. Uh, we we consider them test networks, so they're not really getting very good service right now because we're working out the bugs and stuff. Um, but in in general, um, the model that we want to have is where there's no agreement with a company to get the equipment. It's like people people buy the equipment. Um, and it, at a, you know, at a, it's, it's not necessarily, it's not like free, it's not, it's not really, really cheap, but it's like, you know, a, a setup might be, um, if you look at like a, a setup with a radio dish and a mount and a router and stuff, it might be about $200. And uh, if, if it's just like, like let's say in, in, in Columbia, if it's just a setup where it's like an ethernet cable coming through the wall and then hooking into a router, it's just the cost of the router, which uh, those routers are like $20. So, um, yeah, we're not like uh, leasing people the equipment or doing anything like that. And our hope is as this starts to work and people start to use it, um, people will, uh, you know, buy, buy the equipment themselves. And we want to change. That's actually an important part of uh, what we're trying to do is we're trying to change it um, from where the network is just something that someone just comes in and gives you and you have no control over to where it's like uh, it's almost like a home improvement kind of thing. Um, and so you need, you, you know, you need, like if, if you, you know, if you have a house, your toilet is not owned by the municipal, you know, sewage system, right? You, you have your own bathroom. And so like, uh, you know, if you need to fix that, you might not know how to do plumbing, but you can hire a plumber. And that's more of the model that we want to have for, for the internet as well. It's like where you own your equipment and you can hook into this network, but uh, and you can hire a specialist if you need to. Um, but it's not like this, this, this big monolithic thing that comes in and says this is, this is how you're getting your internet. Clark? Well, the equipment that the user is going to use, is that going to be, they have to use that equipment? In other words, whatever you're going to put in the house or on top of the roof, they have to use that hardware. Currently, like, as an example, Frontier, they want you to use their modem router, period. And it's a piece of crap. So, but that's my point is, uh, what if a user wants to change something hardware-wise at the, at the point they're using, I guess, 
Yeah, so he was asking, do, do people have to use the equipment that, um, a certain piece of equipment that they might not like? Um, and the answer is kind of nuanced. So in theory, no. Um, in practice, we do have a few models of router that we, uh, that, that we like support. Um, you know, just to, just, just developing software, it's, you know, it's, it's going to be a lot easier to debug one model versus like 100. Um, but if somebody wants to get it working, uh, and it's not, for, for someone who is experienced with Linux and stuff, it's not too hard. Um, they can get it running on, on basically any kind of router. Um, but we, we also, yeah, we, we recommend a few in here. This is like, this is the basic model. Um, this is, uh, this small one here does about 100 megabits. Um, and then this thing uh, is deluxe. <laughs> uh, this will do like, uh, I think like 300? 400. 400, yeah. So uh, that's, that's kind of, um, and then we have these ones. There's one in the back. I don't have it up here, but, but they'll do about 20. Um, so we're always like trying to figure out what, what the better options are, but at the same time, we mainly support this $90 router. Um, so oh, it's an edge router too. This is more for more of a commercial setup. Um, this doesn't have, it's not a Wi-Fi hotspot. It's, a, it's just for, for cables, but, uh, but yeah. As far as the radio equipment outside goes, um, it's, generally better to use, uh, on two ends of a link, it's generally better to use equipment that's made by the same manufacturer and is designed to work together um, because they'll have different things they do to optimize it and stuff. Um, and then manufacturers will generally only test their equipment with equipment, their own equipment, right? They're like, you should buy all our equipment. So, so that's, practically that's like what you want to do. Um, and that's, the, that's also going to be part of the role of the subnet DAO. So in, in Klatsk and I, let's say Clark is an intermediary node. Um, and he's just, he's a property owner. He's, he's got uh, some equipment set up, uh, maybe a tower or something. And then the subnet DAO is, you know, run by Debra uh, and her group of volunteers. And um, they're, uh, they're kind of showing people how to set stuff up. And they might give Clark advice on what equipment to use as well. Um, and, and then also the end users probably want to get equipment that's like matched up to uh, Clark's tower equipment. Yes? Oh, uh, I saw you guys were using Ubiquity. Yeah, so the question was, uh, we're using Ubiquity, that's a, that's a manufacturer of, uh, of radio hardware. And we use that um, uh, mostly just because I have experience using Ubiquity, and um, it's also like one of the cheapest brands. Um, and they, they are generally very good, and so a lot of wireless ISPs use them too, it's one of the most popular brands. Um, our software doesn't actually do anything to the radio equipment. Uh, it's all in the router. And so it just hooks up to the radio stuff over Ethernet, and uh, that's all normal. So um, there's another one that we've experimented with. It's called Wireless Wire. It's by another company called Microtik um, that can go a lot faster, uh, but it's also a lot shorter range. So there's, there's a lot of options. Um, we're personally more familiar with Ubiquity, but uh, every network uh, might use different equipment. Yes? Um, so like as, as a user, when I'm sending my traffic to an exit node, I could, can I also still do like HTTPS over top of that? Yeah, so he's asking, uh, as a user, you're sending your traffic to an exit node, uh, can you also use HTTPS? Yes, yeah, so the exit node is like basically like a VPN. It's almost completely transparent. There's just that one screen where you select it. Uh, you want to select one in your region. Right now, we run the exit nodes. Um, in theory, to be fully decentralized, we, you know, we want people to sort of be able to choose their own exit node. Um, in practice, obviously, we have to give people an easy option. So uh, yeah, so, so that exit node is going to encrypt your traffic. Um, and what that will, and most traffic is HTTPS anyway, which is, which is the encryption that web pages use. And so the exit node will not be able to see what's, what you're doing on a web page, but it will be able to see what web pages you're on. And that's what any ISP can see. And there's really no way around that other than using Tor, which is like a dark net protocol, which, which slows things down quite a bit. So um, yeah, that's how the exit nodes work. And uh, you don't necessarily want your neighbor seeing you know, the websites you're on. Like even if they can't see what you're doing on the websites, it's you know, maybe a little weird. So yeah. <laughs> yes? Uh, for payments, how often do you actually settle up for uh, that? Because like, Ethereum is not going to scale yeah. billion routers. <laughs> yeah, so he was asking for payments, how often do we settle up? So what we do is we use something called payment channels. Um, we use a simple form of payment channels, and, and that's basically, I'm not going to get too deep into the exact 
particulars of it, but basically two routers, uh, two routers see each other, and um, they basically, using some some different uh, some, some different metrics to judge on, they, they establish whether they might want to pay this other node in the future, and then they do what's called opening a channel, and so they basically lock some money up, they lock some tokens up, which can then be slowly released to the other um, to the other node, and so. That locking up of the tokens that does require a blockchain transaction, and um, that uh, at current gas prices that um, would uh, be about twenty cents, um, which is probably kind of on the upper range of, of what can work. Because you imagine if you, you know, if you have um, if you're locking up two dollars to possibly pay for internet from some node, um, that's ten percent. Um, so, however, there are a lot of improvements. Ethereum is known to be rather slow and expensive, um, so there are a lot of improvements on the horizon. Uh, we, we've been looking at one, uh, another blockchain called Cosmos. The benefit there is that in theory it should be able to run our existing code, which is made for Ethereum. There's also um, EOS, uh, we have some people from, in the room from EOS, um, also a much faster blockchain as well. Um, so those faster blockchains, I think those fees are going to be a lot lower, um, and also uh, the speed is not actually a big deal for us, but, but yeah, the fees are, so that's yeah. how that works. Well, the developer pays for it, so. Um, it's the RAM cost, but there isn't a per transaction fee. Yeah. Like there is an Ethereum, so that makes it easier. Yeah, so there's, there's, a, lot of, there's a lot of details to it, um, but uh, that's, that's basically, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> complicated blockchain stuff. Um, yes? So, um, you mentioned that the router, each router has to preload some currency on there in order to send packages. Now, if someone forgot, you know, as it likely happened to them, and somehow there's, there's nothing on their, on their router, if they're, standing, if they're standing between someone downstream and another router upstream, that router would still allow the, the, pack, the information to pass. Oh, so are you asking if an intermediary node that's serving, uh, that's both paying for bandwidth and also serving other nodes, uh, basically forgot to load up their router? Um, that wouldn't be an issue because the intermediary node is getting money in from the nodes it's serving, and it's using that money to, uh, to pay for the bandwidth from the node that's upstream of it. Upstream means like closer to the internet. So, uh, and, and generally, they'll also be um, getting a profit off of that as well. So, uh, so not only, not only would they um, have enough money to pay for it, they'd also be earning money. So, um, yeah, it's a big concern with intermediaries is like someone tripping over the power cord or something. Um, that that would be that would be bad. So, um, so in general, there's there's two there's two solutions to intermediaries being flaky. Number one solution is to use, and this is also an, uh, an issue in any network, not just ours. One solution is to use more intermediaries so that every node has like at least two paths, because the odds of two intermediaries being flaky at once is very, very low, um, even if they're both pretty flaky. Uh, the other solution is to have in intermediary nodes that are, are more professionally run, and so you might have a battery backup um, or, or have somebody ready to fix it really quick um, if something does go wrong. Um, so. Uh, so yeah, that's that's in, in most wireless ISPs they they have the second solution where they really take their tower maintenance really seriously. But there's also some ISPs uh, that are coming out that that use more um, more 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 intermediaries where there's more paths to the internet. And uh, so Althea, the software doesn't it will work with both because it will switch over to whatever's working pretty quickly. So this, uh, oh yeah. It's connected to US West right now. This one, right? and, and that's a. Uh, that's the exit node? Yeah, that's right. And that's uh, like, a, like a WireGuard VPN server or something? Or? Yeah, exactly. So uh, he was asking, the, the, the router in this room right now is connected to our exit node US West, which is at Hurricane Electric in Fremont and uh, in California. And uh, that is, um, it is using WireGuard. Uh, WireGuard is a VPN, a very fast VPN um, technology. Uh, the exit nodes also do a few other things. So. Um, they, they also can do speed tests. They can make sure that the intermediary nodes are, are they're, not running, like, they're not running some version of the firmware that's like lying about the quality and stuff. It's always sort of double checked with what the exit node is seeing for quality. Um, and so they have a few different functions. They're not just a VPN server, but that is the main, the main thing is VPN server. So do the downstream nodes pay that also? 
also that had a U.S. Lessor. Is that right? Yeah. So I actually have another presentation where I get more into the uh, into the protocol, and, and I have a lot of there's a lot of circles and. Uh, lines and stuff in there, <laughs> diagrams and stuff. Um, but basically the way it works is that every node, um, it's not actually technically paying for internet access, which would be both upload and download. It's actually only paying for upload. Um, so your client node is paying to forward packets to the exit server. And the client node has a payment channel open with the exit server, where the exit server then pays to have the response traffic go back down through the network back to your client node. Um, so that's kind of how it works at a very low level. Yes? Um, do you have a name for, for all of like ISPs and intermediaries, like autonomous systems or something with that? No, he's asking if, if uh, we have a name for intermediaries like autonomous systems. Um, the autonomous systems is like how BGP works, which is the routing protocol that's used on uh, the backbone of the internet. And the backbone of the internet actually functions a lot like an Althea network. Um, or oh, it should be the other way around. Althea network functions like the backbone. But basically, an autonomous system on the backbone is, um, is an ISP or a network. And that network's making decisions about who to connect to and who has the best prices. And those decisions are made by, by people. These are really big networks, people in data centers and, and, and business people making deals and stuff. Um, so as far, if you want to use that metaphor, um, every, um, every Althea router is actually its own autonomous system. But the autonomous system concept is a concept from the BGP routing protocol, and we use Babel. Um, so it's not, it's, it's not really. The router's IP address is basically like its autonomous system. Uh, one, one other detail, though, is that uh, the subnet DAOs, they each have a, um, a network of, they're, they're essentially giving out IP addresses. Um, so they have a range of IP addresses, and they give that out to, uh, to the nodes that are on the network out of that range. And, um, they, they basically can be up to probably 10,000 10, routers in one network. Um, and over that size, you need multiple subnet DAOs. But we want them to be local and, and, and stuff anyway, so that makes sense. Oh, time's up. One more question. Uh, well, I have two questions. So. <laughs> set up uh, a network, um, people just have to plaster by with the LC of firmware and then, you know, mesh them together. Um, once the subnet uh, DAO is in place, would it be necessary for each router to register with the subnet DAO in order for it to function in the network? That's a good question. He's asking right now, it's like pretty easy. The routers will connect to each other with no problems. Um, once subnet DAOs are in, in place, um, will it be harder to connect routers together? Um, the answer to that is, is, is like kind of. Um, you don't have to. You could just set up your own subnet DAO on the spur of the moment and do that. Or you could even turn it off on the router. Um, I don't know if we have that. We certainly don't have turning off the subnet DAO uh, in, in the UI right now. Um, but you could turn it off. At the end of the day, though, the routers are going to need to have IP addresses. So um, if you turn off, like if, if you're not using a subnet DAO and uh, your router is just going to generate a random IP address out of the private range, which is for like local networks, and there's no coordination with other networks. And so, um, if there are other Althea networks around, it's not going to be able to um, like like talk to them to, to route traffic over. But it's it will be it will still be possible to do things the way they're done now, which is basically like a private network. Which the Althea routers now are essentially hooked up on a network using. Um, these randomly generate, generated IP addresses, which is like the same as, as it is in like your home network, basically. So. All right.